And now with blockchain, there's a technology that is decentralized, that relies on each individual participant to contribute to a consensus. And conceptually, one could argue that blockchain is a new type of or new kind of institution. So in that sense, <coughs> you should be afraid because blockchain is a competitor. Your trust may be replaced by decentralized trust. So you should be afraid. And that's why uh, maybe you're not visionary enough, but how can we leverage the trust that we have in a blockchain ecosystem? And that's why I mentioned this broad range of blockchain technologies. I think the radically decentralized approach is nice, but it's costly. And if it's a pure private blockchain, that's nice too, but that's an expensive database. And I think the sweet spot is in the middle, where a few or a certain number of trusted participants come together and create their own blockchain, their own consensus. And I think that's where the opportunity for postlopers really is. Not rely on an existing blockchain, but create your own as, as members of UPU. And UPU might uh, play an important role in bringing you together on your own so consensus system. Just building on that, picking up the final point that was made, or one of the final points made with Zlati and talking about a global thing, do you think the opportunity is now for a global postal blockchain application uh, as such? Definitely. Um, well, consortium are forming all over the world, so it's really time to act. And I think if you want to have blockchain-based services, you need a blockchain to rely on. And which blockchain do you can rely on? I think it should be a postal blockchain. I give you an example in Switzerland. Um, there is not a sector specific, but a national blockchain. Swiss Post together with Swisscom, the telecommunications incumbent, form a consortium to have a Swiss blockchain as a new kind of infrastructure Swiss companies can rely on to do business. We already have an over-the-counter uh, stock market on this platform run by Swiss Post and Swisscom. We have a, a pilot project by uh, Swiss Post together with a local uh, energy utility running on this uh, consortium blockchain. And I think that's the way forward. There are applications, but there's not yet a good infrastructure, and I think you have to build infrastructure as well. So that, right? infrastructure, this that, postal that infrastructure, infrastructure in Switzerland is working for the benefit of Swisscom, Swiss Post, and all the Swiss companies. It is run by Swiss Post and Swisscom to provide services to so all So that, in a way, is a, is a micro model of what could happen globally. Exactly. It's not sector specific, like the one yeah. that's proposed here, but it's country specific. Yeah. And I think both approaches have their merits. Okay, so if I might interject. That's a great uh, thing you said, but the reality is we've already thought of that. Uh, the um, the decentralized ID standard is already supported by IBM Hyper Hyperledger, which is permissioned, and Ethereum, which is unpermissioned. And what we're doing is we're proposing something called a decentralized ID. It's called a DID. We're doing something called a DID method. So a method is this new term for how do you create a trust anchor. So we think that the posts and the UPU could actually form the ideal trust anchor because you are more trusted than Facebook or governments and banks, right? So uh, the universal service uh, agreement that you've made for hundreds of years has actually paid off in your branding and also in your performance. So I, I, I again, I invite you to sit in on the uh, workshop uh, tomorrow afternoon to talk about this where we'll delve into these issues. Can I ask you, while you're speaking, Morris, Moses, any reflections on what you heard from the session before, from what the postal operators were saying? I mean, applications that you thought were promising ones. I know you're talking about the future vision and everything else, but things that we could build on. Yeah, yeah. The, all of the work that um, Egypt and uh, Croatia and um, Turkey. Turkey have been working on are spectacular. The, the, the biggest issue is if they didn't have access to international players, they may have Im implemented a regional solution that will have to be globalized at a later time. Uh, for example, what blockchain identity system do you want to use? There are about a hundred of them. It's the standard <laughs> ones that we want to work on that are supported by Microsoft, IBM, and, and Ethereum. Uh, so uh, those are the issues that we need to talk about. But the idea for a consortium is actually to integrate those learnings into uh, the broader uh, network. So one of the things that our company has uh, developed is something we call the IP blockchain for intellectual property. So it allows some posts to submit with their learnings 
and monetize it by licensing it to others. So there may be ways to use a blockchain to do that. And even the uh, governance problem uh, of having not having a quorum, you can actually solve that with blockchain voting and a mobile device that has a hardware wallet that can uh, tie each UPU a represent, uh, postal representative into system and have 100% quorum all the time uh, online. And we'd love to talk about those solutions and deploying them first in this industry, which would literally take the industry by storm. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have one more question for these guys, but while I'm doing that, have a th think of what questions you have for, if you like, experts in the blockchain who you might want to ask in a minute, and I'll come to you to involve you. But uh, the next question I wanted to ask was really about the scope of applications and how we think about this, because uh, there, we've heard lots of different kinds of applications from ID, from addressing, from uh, supply chain, from payment systems, from philatelic, uh, et cetera, et cetera, cryptocurrencies. <coughs> is it literally, uh, in your opinion, I'll start with you, Christian, is it in your, in your opinion that every service and product and internal process, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we've heard of some of those internal processes as well, can be enhanced or improved <coughs> with a blockchain application. In other words, is, is, the, is the scope for uh, in, in using blockchain throughout our business, it's not just one little bit here to do something on the edge, it's, it's actually could turn our business upside down and be involved in every aspect of it. I would say potentially yes, but we have to be well aware that blockchain is a technology and there yeah. are other competing technologies, yes. so blockchain is not... It's not the answer it, to everything. Yeah, it's, it doesn't answer anything, it might answer specific, specific things. And some of these things are not quite obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, e-commerce is a very important business for postal operators nowadays. Um, e-commerce very much relies on the trust between the seller and the buyer. Mm -hmm. And with traditional payment systems, payment is expensive and the risk is with, with the seller because the buyer can al always uh, reverse his payment transaction. Now with cryptocurrencies, transactions can be irreversible, which shifts the risk from the sellers to the buyers and then again it comes to who trusts whom and this has an effect on electronic commerce my expectation would be that it's going to get another boost if payments become irreversible because of the better allocation of risk in this system mm -hmm. so postal operators are affected by blockchain technology not just by employing it by themselves in or the using it for their internal services but by how their customers be it the sellers or the buyers use this, this technology. So that's one thing that would not be directly uh, obvious. Another point that, had, that has not yet been uh, talked about is uh, tokenization. I personally believe that one of the biggest applications of blockchain is the tokenization of real world assets. So to put assets- Anything of value really put values on a blockchain and make them transferable and tradable. And this transfer might be trustless because it happens on a, on a blockchain. However, somebody has to guarantee for this digital representation of a real good, has to issue it. And who can do that? It cannot be me personally because you might not trust me. There we need trusted institutions like postal services. So I think an important role for postal operators might also be issuing <coughs> digital goods, like a stable coin, for example, guaranteeing for a stable coin, or guaranteeing for other things that you might be able to guarantee due to your local presence that makes you uh, the best option to, to uh, report to the blockchain what the state of the world is, for example, if there's a need for um, smart contracts to be resolved based on a certain local state of the world. You are the ones that are trusted, that can give real world information back to this uh, virtual ecosystem. Thank you. Just just adding on that on the e-commerce side, there's a very nice application heard of two or three years ago in New Zealand Post, who are using it for provenance for their, their New Zealand real goods. Yeah. When there's a lot of fake goods on the market, uh, they're using blockchain to to, to guarantee that this is really New Zealand honey or New Zealand wine, uh, where many fake goods are being presented as well. So some things about security and authenticity and, and, and that sort of thing can, 
enhance the, the, the process of e-commerce. And you can only do it if you're locally present. Yes. If you know where the honey comes from. Yes. If that's you. Yes. So Moses. one of our pilots is called the in-person proofing pilot. Um, if the UPU could help create a global standard for in-person verification and binding to digital identities, this will be supported by every e-commerce company in the world. It's a multi-billion dollar market. And it's something you could do now, but you need to make it standardized so that everyone deploys the same way and talks. And we think that decentralized ID is the way to go because everybody's supporting it right now and it's the next thing. Um, and again, the experts at the UPU have studied it and said, it looks like the standard to, to back. Can I open it to the floor now? You might want some questions for these uh, uh, experts on blockchain or what they've been saying so far or following up our discussion before. Who would like to ask a question now? Yes, sir. The microphone's coming to you if you could say. I know. Thank you. Well. Thank you very much. My name is Walter Trezek. I'm the chairman of the consultative committee, the UPU, so representing the wider stakeholders here as well. Um, I was I was looking through the UPU standards, and uh, I'm happy to say that I found a standard where all that work could actually be based on. It's our S68 <coughs> uh, Postal Identity Management and Trust Framework Standard. Um, I think I think we found the basis for the next steps of the work already. Uh, the next standards board is in three weeks' time, so I will refer that back to our good friend uh, from Post Italiane and ask him the question, what should be done with our S68, um, which currently has status zero, so not really used by anyone. No, um, that would be very interesting. Um, are you familiar with that standard? Uh, Have you seen those standards already? Yes, we've been studying them. Thank you. Uh, however, I want to say that Actually, the easiest standard to get embedded into a World Wide Web uh, browser standard is S42 for addressing. Uh, for example, the pilot that's being done at the Port of Philadelphia being uh, uh, developed by the, actually the US Postal Service now, um, that actually is using the, uh, it doesn't have an addressing standard in it. So actually using S42 could be injected into that pilot very quickly and you could uh, get adoption outside of the postal industry using it because it's, it's very good uh, data that you have. X68, S68, uh, it looks like it's an easy one to integrate and I think uh, you could get adoption as well, but I would recommend doing S42 first. It's, an, it's like an easy win uh, and it would introduce the postal industry into the uh, wider technology world. Thank you, Walter, for that question. And may, it may be by setting the standard that it, is, it brings other people on board and, and puts the post in the front position. Although I have to say, getting standards agreed and sorted out doesn't, isn't always the quickest thing, is it, uh, to do. Um, Maybe just one of yeah, sorry. talking about applications within the UPU, uh, we did a study a few years ago with Swiss Economics about uh, parcel quality of service. And one thing we found was that uh, uh, quite a number of parcels seem to arrive earlier than they were sent. So time stamping seems to be an issue. <laughs> and this issue can easily be solved by blockchain. So that would be a very low hanging fruit for um, your cooperation at UP level to use a blockchain to agree on timestamps for parcels later. And there's lots of authentication of, of tracking uh, uh, events and supply chain things and quality of service statistics and data generally that would be benefit from it, wouldn't they? Right, we, some other questions. I'm sure we've got some other questions or comments on this. You've got your opportunity now to ask. I, I have a good question. Okay, yes, ma'am. What are the primary inhibitors of success for the postal industry? So why, what's stopping you uh, getting involved in this? Anybody want to volunteer? What are the, what are the difficulties? To do what? To, to get involved in blockchain. Do you want to yes, we'll have the microphone up here? Let's get down to the practical things. It's all very well talking about this in theory. Let's get down to practical things from Cote d'Ivoire. No, I'm, uh, I'm interested to discuss with him uh, for the next step because I heard that uh, blockchain is not uh, all about crypto money, but uh, also for other uh, activities. And I'm interested it's about to have a chat with you regarding our 
e-commerce project and uh, all the stuff as well. I look forward to it. I'll just be out there. All okay, so you want to talk about other possible applications. Thank you, Isaac. Okay, let's go back to inhibitors. Oh, to Dr. Khalid from Jordan. Uh, sir, uh, thank you for the, the question. Uh, I see the blockchain and the cryptocurrency there. Uh, I mean, the main obstacle is the central banks in, in our countries. For example, in, in Jordan, it's not allowed yet. Uh, to use the cryptocurrency, not at all. Not at all. Okay. So I think this is the legislation part is a very important issue in uh, developing and uh, going with the blockchain, the cryptocurrency. So that's an inhibitor in, in your particular case in your country. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. So uh, I wanted to address this directly. Uh, we identified that as one of the critical issues. The, the reality is that when you have a bunch of crypto anarchists uh, presenting stuff to the government, it's not gonna go over well. Uh, instead, we, fo we found someone who worked at a central bank and it's doable if you do certain things. For example, all you have to do is put in a, um, a circuit breaker into the wallet so that the central bank has control over how much money flows out of the, or into the, uh, the economy. And then that actually will get them to say yes, and then you need to have a team of economic economists run economic models and simulations and show data, right? It's like, we believe this will actually improve the economy. If you show the data, they'll say, we'll take a chance on the pilot. If you don't have any data and you have people saying, we're gonna bring down the system with crypto, there's no way it's gonna get adopted. Uh, so that's so why I think we can actually produce the ammunition you need to show the government that you know how to, to deploy something. Now, Facebook didn't even do it right. They, they built it first and told the governments we're going to deploy. And if you look at countries like, um, I forget, it's one of the African countries, it's getting destabilized by crypto right now. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Uh, probably, you know, so, so basically- uh, There's three, quite a few destabilized countries at the moment. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so it, it is possible that crypto could uh, accelerate destabilization of, of, of local fiat. And you actually have to worry about that because you don't want uh, mistakes. You uh, you actually want to put in uh, technologies that are for smart deployment. Uh, so circuit breakers would be the first thing we would look at and test in our economic modeling. Yes, thank you. It's uh, it's, uh, it's an economic model more than technology. You know, the easiest part in this uh, blockchain on any solution is the technology part. Uh, I, I wish uh, that the, the the way you explain it to convince the government is easy as you explain just bring the data and go. You, you know, uh, and, and our services, we will actually go and explain it to your government along with a study by a number of economists. Because the governments have to see, you know, the invention of paper money helped America, right? America financed its revolution by printing a paper money. The success of the revolution made the European bankers go, that's an interesting invention. You know, if you can actually, you know, kickstart uh, like an ICO for the country, you know, maybe we could use this later. Digital currency has as much power as paper currency. It is the next thing, but it can't be just only revolution re run. It has to be a merger and a collaboration of the revolutionaries with the uh, central banks. So that's our model, and I think it's it's doable. We will definitely produce a package that you could show to a government official or ministry that they'll say, okay, do the uh, local version of this for us, and then we'll consider it. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so for Jordan, then maybe uh, some credible uh, approach to the government, not, not uh, crypto anarchists or something like this. Um, let's go to Paul and then go to Kenya or, or Nigeria again. No, Nigeria or Kenya, yeah. Kenya first and then Nigeria. Or vice versa, Nigeria. Okay. <laughs> we're, in, we're in the stable parts of Africa, Thank you. right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Moses, yes. I, I, the only thing, I appreciate your presentation and I think it's uh, something that uh, we as Kenya would want to. My only, um, your language is so silicon. <laughs> uh, is there a way of simplifying it? <laughs> yeah. So that for our everyday application, you, it's so Silicon Valley like just because we want to, my, my employees are 45 and above, and they are permanent employees, and they are supposed to be really the ones uh, who are to apply this. 
So when we go to you tomorrow, am I going to take something that I can take home and apply it without too much? To translate it to simple Swahili. <laughs> yeah, so uh, to answer that, the uh, two things that we're offering is we have a kickstart um, training that we can actually deploy either online at a very low cost or we'll come to your country and do this because uh, the emerging economies actually need to catch up and we want to be there to help you do that and become literate in blockchain and decentralization technology. It's not that difficult. Now in terms of actual applications deployed, uh, we, we have very good Silicon Valley developers that are like Apple-like. We believe in interfaces that don't require technology. So uh, the interfaces that we can show you will, for example, have a localized chatbot that will explain what a crypto is to a user in the, in the local language. So we're working with a uh, computational linguistic scientist to create a multilingual chatbot that can actually explain crypto and how to ma manage it to regular users in, in your language. Okay, okay so we're, we're getting there. We, we need a credible person, de-jargonized, simple language. Let's come to BC that's behind you, it's the side of you. Nipos. Thank you, Mr. Ma. Um, as the biggest market for e-commerce in Africa, you know that we've got the numbers in Nigeria in terms of population. Mm -hmm. So naturally talking about blockchain, vis-a-vis -vis, um, improving processes in e-commerce will be interesting to us. Now, I drive an organization that is uh, <coughs> driven by government work commercializing now, largely constipated, bureaucratically, <laughs> and then the workforce is aging, to use the expression of uh, the uh, <coughs> which I'm going to talk about. Now, is it advisable to leapfrog from simple processes of automation to blockchain? Because there's that fear that where I come from, you must learn to crawl before you walk. Uh, I have a very good answer for you. Uh, I, I helped um, a, one of the major banks in the US do a transformation project, and the uh, head of the innovation uh, group, who later was advanced on the success of the innovation project to be number three in the bank, uh, he actually was a snowboarder, right? And so when we deployed this, he said, something occurred to me. Innovation is like snowboarding. And I said, why? And he said, because it's actually safer to do it a little bit faster than your comfort zone. You'll fall off a lot less. If you, on a snowboard or skis or motorcycling, if you go as slow as your comfort, you'll just be falling off. You have to go a little bit faster then you have a higher success rate. So one of the things we teach in our uh, Kickstart training is to learn how to uh, just move a little bit beyond your comfort zone. Because staying within your comfort zone is, uh, is the marker for not succeeding in the new technological world. So, and the other thing I'm gonna add is that if you do the proper use of blockchain and AI, it simplifies everything. It's actually simpler to do that. It's harder for your technologists, you need a, uh, external developers to help you, but in terms of your users and in terms of uh, the workflow process for your customers, it'll actually simplify them, okay? Can I come to Christian, any reflections on these last couple of questions? Because Moses has been asking them. Um, well, my point would be to try to force blockchain onto everything. It's just a technology. It's not great per se. It's great if it serves a purpose. And my advice would be look for a situation where you have interaction between a certain number of parties. These parties may not trust each other fully, and it's a process that can be automated. Those are the situations where blockchain fit. If it's a situation where everybody trusts everybody anyway, you may use a simple database. If it's a situation where you are on your own without interaction with a lot of other parties, just use a database. So a blockchain is not a perfect fit for every situation, but should be well traded off against other technological possibilities. Okay, come back to another. Oh, Linda Way there first, then Fiji, then Paul. And then that would, and I think. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I just, I'm just thinking aloud here, um, understanding that different countries have different dynamics and different regulatory framework. Um, and others are highly regulated, and others they can just kick the ground running. 
And where I'm sitting, uh, to simplify the process, I'm more interested on the possible application beyond just the financial cryptocurrency aspect of the blockchain. I'm now thinking that innovation is about also working smarter, disruptive methods to get new ways of doing things. And just opposing with what my colleague from Nigeria was saying, um, and, and what you were saying in relation to a discomfort, because sometimes when you're incremental, you actually, you could actually be caught napping. You know, sometimes you have to, to be being banged, to adopt a being bang approach. How, how do you reconcile all these complex contradictions? And, and, and in, a, in our situation coming from a developing country, um, South Africa is a, it, 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 it's contrasted, you know, it's very complex and it contrasts with other regulatory framework, but at the same time it's adopting digital transformation agenda and in the context of a postal operations where around the potential applications, especially in the context of the e-commerce because that is the future in terms of our reform, where should one place themselves strategically in dealing with the economic disruptors using the blockchain as a catalyst for reform? Thank you. Good, good question, thank you. Uh, who wants to take that first? Christian. I think there's still a lot of skepticism regarding this new technology. And so the first step would be make people familiar with the opportunities that it brings. And for example, from a governmental or regulatory perspective, the opportunity is accountability, traceability. So I would approach regulatory bodies because I, I'm a regulatory economist, so I believe very much <laughs> in, in regulation <laughs> and regulatory frameworks. So if we want to get something started, we need the right regulatory framework. So uh, if you have a project, if you have an idea, buy in the regulator by pointing out his opportunities. It's, it will be, become more easy for him to oversee your activities because blockchain is not just about trust, it's about transparency as well towards the regulator. So get the buy-in from these stakeholders by pointing out the opportunities they get from this technology. So get the regulators on board, and it makes their job easier, actually, with yeah. the transparency as well. So thank you for that. Uh, Fiji? Thank you, speakers, for um, all this technology. Well, I think most of us know the, all those technology, which is blockchain, AI, and machine learning, and talking about <laughs> cryptocurrency. Unfortunately, none of them has really proven within a couple of years' time that they are with sacred technology. So what we really wanted to know is uh, what are the resources required to put the blockchain technology into the postal services? Second is what sort of duration is required to establish this technology? What sort of costing you will be working on to those things? I think these are the uh, important parameters we need to know. I think the presenter has kept all those secret as a <laughs> trailer giving today and then maybe the uh, may, movie to the workshop tomorrow. Is that right? Realistically, how, what does it involve? What are the resources? What's the time scale? Just be brief if you could. Okay, so I, I'm going to tell you that you can't do it on postal time frames, right? It's like, <laughs> can we talk? Uh, my, the first response I got when I said we wanted to do this from the UP was, can we schedule this for next year, right? So you can't answer that way. Um, for our projects, we actually look for existing technology projects that we can just inject some AI into and then make you leapfrog. But it's like already working stuff. So our time frame for everything we're doing is about six months, which I think is faster than you guys could do. Is that correct? But anyway, so uh, we can definitely do that. And also, if you have enough partners investing in a consortium, the cost of it is divided by those uh, that number of people so that it will be a fraction of what you would have to pay to do it yourself with uh, internationally qualified talent. Can I just ask a question of Christian? I know Switzerland is different from Fiji a little bit, but Swiss Post has developed a framework which they're using nationally. Quick comment about that. So, so Swiss Post has a few projects related to blockchain, and my point would be don't start by conquering the world. Start small. You, you can start small with blockchain. Pick a small project like Swiss Post, pick the um, collaboration with the local energy utility to, to meter uh, certain uh, electricity usage. That's a very small use case and see whether it works. 
Exactly. Once it works, go big. What would you tell us? I'm going to tell you that uh, working together, you can't conquer the world. It's like can, up front. Can I just